That brings us to the next item on our agenda, and I'll recognize uh, Dr. Melton for a superintendent's report. Chairman Cates, thank you so much. Let me do a quick volume check, because I know we have a lot listening online as well as those in the room. Um, I thank everyone who came out this evening to speak. Just as this room is divided, I can tell you my inbox is divided. This is a very difficult conversation, um, the most difficult presentations that, we're, that I have given in my career thus far. But for all of you to know, I take this responsibility very seriously, very seriously. For those that know me well, you know how I've arrived at this position tonight of this conversation. Those that know me well know that I'm a person of prayer, and I've reached out to many partners that I know believe in prayer to make sure not just this evening, but days leading up to this evening since March the 16th. That's when we started planning for reentry without knowing what to expect. When? That would be April or May, or whether that would be August. So for those of you that have been informed and have chosen to give us grace, I say thank you. Last time we met on July the 13th, I compared this with a weather incident. It's ever-changing and dynamic, but there is no radar. There is science, there is data, there are opinions. And so with that, I have to make decisions with my staff, of which many are here this evening of reentry, but there are others that are not here. None of our three committees are here. And although our slides showed who chose to participate, our slides did not show who declined the invitations to participate with our three committees because of their own work responsibilities, their family responsibilities, or their own personal well-being. So I hope that when you've looked at the slides, you've seen those that chose to participate, but understand all the names are not there that were invited to participate. You will see changes tonight in this presentation. If you were to ask board members, they can tell you they got this presentation unlike most times, because usually they get my superintendent's reports with board packet. The reentry team and I met again this afternoon, beginning at 1 o'clock. So when the board received that in their inbox later this afternoon, we had just finalized these details with a sense of responsibility and a dedication of commitment. On July the 13th, I asked that we have conversations rather than statements. A statement is one way, a conversation is respectful in two ways. I thank everyone who has been involved with the conversation. The volume of information we've received from our families through our reentry site, those that have reached out via phone, via email, we say thank you for participating in conversation. That is a tenet of School District 5, is having an engaged community that cares and knows that we want to hear you. Unfortunately, there have been some conversations or some statements that have concerned me, quite frankly. And I hope that we have a community where I can be candid with you, because again, those that know me well know that I try to be direct so that you don't have to try to infer what is she saying. So I'll be direct with everyone, whether they're listening online or in the room with us this evening. Some of the conversations and statements have concerned me. I've heard from staff of how families that they thought they had relationships with have gotten so emotional that they have felt compromised with the relationships. Families are under a lot of stress. And because of that, some things that were being said, our teachers and our staff are taking very personally. I continue to say our staff did not meet expectations. They exceeded expectations. Were we perfect? I said on the 13th, absolutely not. Progression, not perfection. And those that engage in conversations, you can help us make sure that we continue to have progression while we strive to meet your expectations. Our staff works hard. I'm no, I know with confidence that our staff cares. And as a leader of this school district or the executive official, I strive to focus on our students and their well-being physically, socially, emotionally, and academically. But I also hope that people will say I'm supportive of staff physically, socially, and emotionally. Our community, obviously, by this room tonight, is divided. I hope after this evening that we can come together. District 5 has a reputation of academic excellence, of art excellence, of athletic excellence, of enrichment opportunities. And I hope after this evening we can come together because this is an opportunity to either define School District 5 or to refine School District 5. I hope that we can do this together to refine. We are focused on safety. That is our principles. That is a priority of my five. 
And with that focus on safety, that's inclusive of faculty and staff and students. And it is a tenet of School District 5 to provide choice. It is my expectation that we're going to resume on-site instruction with responsibility when the time is appropriate, with our commitment to responsibly monitor our ever-changing information and dynamic, dynamics so that we can let our families know, our staff know, our students know when we feel that we can offer an on-site experience for instruction. We are maintaining a focus on our mission and our vision. We take that with great responsibility. And with that, you're going to see that we're going to move the pendulum forward tonight. But just like I said on the 13th, this is changing. 2020-21 promises not to be a sprint, but a marathon. Because it's a marathon, we are conditioning. We will have endurance, and we will perform with excellence. So I ask you tonight, whether you're in the room with us physically or joining us virtually online, that you hear us at this moment and know that this is information that we feel is appropriate, that I support and that I bring tonight for information to the board. Chairman Cates, for you and the board to know, I am not asking for action. That's been a question among board members. That is not my request as eating to have action as a chief executive officer of this school district. But I can say that we will continue to update and communicate. But I cannot say dynamics will not change. Since we met on the 13th, data has changed. Cases have changed. Positive cases have changed. Our zip codes continue to be monitored. So because of that, we will give our families as much respect and opportunities as possible to be prepared. But I'm responsible for the safety and well-being of our staff and also of our students, which definitely affects our community. As you look tonight to the slideshow, and I will pause for it to be pulled up by our technical staff, you're going to see this is entitled our reentry plan overview part two. I can't predict how many parts this might have, but I can say that we are closer to the window as required by Accelerate Ed Task Force report, that we're closer to that window to make sure that families have information to start making decisions for their children. This next slide of our five principles have been referenced several times already this evening through public participation. I thank you for being mindful for being engaged and being aware that this is what we're striving to accomplish. Some have questioned, well, why is principle one not on top? If we could advance the slide, please, whoever's got the clicker for me. Some have asked, why is principle one not on top? If you notice, it rotates around the circle to make sure that we're looking, because there is no priority. It's all ever-changing. If you haven't seen that slide, it's posted online for everyone to have a chance to see. So as we move towards the next portion of our presentation, our first section of this presentation this evening will be focused upon our updates since July 13th. I'm going to ask Director Holden to come to the microphone because we have surveyed our students and staff. We want to make sure that we provide a summary. Whenever surveys are given, it's easy to collect information, but unless you turn it to share how the information has been reported, how it's being used, that creates distrust. So we want to make sure that when surveys are given that we are announcing publicly what those results are so that people can see we need you engaged in the conversation. Director Holden, if you'll lead us through the next portion of this presentation regarding our updates with our teacher and staff surveys and also our family feedback. Yes, ma'am. Can everybody hear me okay? Perfect. Uh, we administered the teacher, staff, and parent survey on July 9th, and we had a tremendous um, response rate from uh, all groups. We had 1,358 responses from our teachers and staff, including 528 comments. Several themes emerged. Uh, first, the staff and teachers placed a priority on the safety of our students, of our teachers and staff. They also expressed concerns about the community spread of COVID-19, the social and emotional health of our students, as well as the academics of our students. The key influences that our teachers listed and staff listed were the spread of COVID-19, the, the belief that children learn best from face-to-face -face instruction, that social distancing is needed, and that we should focus on how we transition our students back into our schools. When we looked at the results of our parent surveys, we saw many of the same themes emerge. We had 7,907 responses, including 3,201 comments. 
We are nearly done reading every comment. We are trying to classify them into overall themes so that we can identify those trends as well. Um, some of them were uh, quite long and we appreciate that feedback. Uh, we, have, we are making every effort to read them as quickly as possible and to identify the common themes and elements of them so we can better understand uh, our community's thoughts and feelings. Uh, but you see the same, same themes emerge. Uh, the priorities of our parents were safety of students, teachers and staff, academics, social and emotional health, and community spread of COVID-19. Key influences for parents were again the belief that children learn best from face-to-face -face instruction, but also the spread of COVID-19, getting our students and their children back into their routines, the need for socialization, and for social distancing to be uh, implemented. We took all those information and we, we, we noticed again that parents, teachers, and staff share the same concerns and their biggest influences are the children learning best from face-to-face -face instruction with a concern about the spread of COVID-19. And our priority in our district is how to ensure the safety of the students, teachers, and staff, while also providing the instruction that is gonna meet the students' needs academically, meet their needs socially, and meet their needs emotionally. That's reinforced in our overall goals as a district in our strategic plan, it's reinforced in our superintendent's priorities, and it's reinforced in our principles for how to re-enter uh, in the fall. That concludes our update on that piece. Thank you, Director Holden. This next slide offers a variety of updates since July 13th when the last uh, board meeting was held. So I will pause for just a moment for you to see the highlights that we've captured on this particular slide. Obviously not to cover every single bullet, but you see some of the highlights are commitment to daily conversations, schedules, and commitments. Then you see some points of time that have been important for our work to include our faculty advisory. Oftentimes we use educational jargon that people don't necessarily understand what does that mean. Faculty advisory is comprised of our teachers of the year that were previously elected and our current teachers of the year. So that is that definition of that group. And then parent advisory, those are elected parent leaders, maybe booster clubs, maybe school improvement council, maybe PTOs, PTAs, PTSOs, whatever parent groups that schools have that recommend that parents participate to offer feedback. And then of course our principals and directors. I cannot celebrate our principals enough. Our principals are becoming, um, they've always been engaging and responsible but their commitment to make sure that they are available to collect feedback from faculty and staff and families, I need to pause this evening to make sure that they get a shout out because their commitment is part of our success without doubt. The next bullet, for those of you that have secondary students, you know how important our course catalog is. You'll notice it says finalization. With any change we make in our instructional program, that affects our course catalog. So those of you with secondary students, if you will notice, we are commitment, our commitments towards finalization of that course catalog, but that is in the point of towards the end of production, not in the initial phases. We are working into that. And then, of course, Dr. Jakes and her team, we've got to make sure that we hear from our staff to understand what their feedback is going to be. So some of this is very current, as you see. Some is still to come, such as the 27th, and others have been underway. The next slide, uh, Chairman Cates has already repre referenced this a little bit earlier. I may need the clicker to have control since I'm having, um, Director Holden, may I have the clicker please, sir? Our reentry website, um, Chairman Cates has alluded to that earlier, thank you. Our reentry address, we've got a sample for you to see to the right so that if you've not been there, you can see what it looks like. We know that websites are common for some people to land, others are intimidating. So we want you to see what it looks like as a sample so that you can see. The website also contains our full reentry plans, which will be inclusive of updates such as tonight. Thank you to everyone who has emailed that address. Our board has received a lot of emails to be in addition to that, but that is an internal communication address that comes to us and then we process and route it appropriately. So I want to make sure if you haven't had access to these informations of tools and resources, that this becomes of note to you so that you can use it accordingly. And then this is a summary um, 
And mind you, these six are nothing compared to what the true FAQ looks like. But we want you to get a flavor or a sense to see what kinds of questions are being asked. And when we get those questions, we want to make sure that we're posting not just the question, but also the response. So I'll pause you to have a chance just to get an idea of how that language and how that content is organized for you. The FAQ can become overwhelming and intimidating, but we continue to develop that content thanks to those that are part of this conversation and engaged with the process of us development together. This document will continue to grow, and we hope that our answers can be short and succinct enough, but detailed enough to give our families assurance as to what we're working towards. The next section of our content is going to be led by our Chief Instructional Officer, Mr. Giuliano. Although Mr. Giuliano is the voice of this presentation, he has worked in conjunction with our entire team. So Mr. Giuliano, if you'll make your way to the podium, he's going to go through some slides with us. The first section of his presentation is a repeat from the previous board meeting, but we want to make sure that we bring this to you. And just for point of reference, not to take away the comments that he may be prepared to make, you're going to see some aster asterisks and updates. Since we presented this information on the 13th of July, we have gone back to update this next portion regarding our five virtual option. So we're building our content, we're reviewing it, we're refining it. We can define or we can refine. And in this process, I hope you can see we're doing both. We're defining what we mean by these options and we're refining it to make sure that you see our commitment to excellence. Mr. G, shall I pass this to you to use or do you prefer I Thank you, Dr. Melton. I did want to mention that the instructional subcommittee actually created options for a traditional, a hybrid, and a vir full virtual option based upon the Accelerate Ed recommendations through the state as well. So here I'm going to be talking about our five, our virtual program, our virtual option. And as Dr. Melton mentioned, you're going to see the asterisks are some updates to our plan from our last presentation, which was in July, July 13th. So I'll draw your attention to the third bullet. And you're going to see there that we are asking our families of elementary school students to commit to at least a quarter and our families of secondary students to commit to at least a semester when selecting their options so we can make sure that our scheduling's in place and we have the appropriate staffing as well. Now, of course, there always could be some special circumstances. So therefore, that families with documented medical needs, they would have a process to go through through our hardship process through our Office of Planning and Administration as well. The other bullets that you see here are just actually ways that we can highlight the requirements for our students and then also some of the requirements for parents and guardians because we know that our families are going to have some difficult choices to make and as they make those choices, we want to make sure that they have the ability to think through what's the best possible environment for their child. As we shift to the next slide, this talks about kindergarten through eighth grade specific details. And it talks about the day and the activities that they're going to take place with the virtual option. They certainly have South Carolina standards-based ELA, math, science, and social studies as well as gifted and talented ELA and math for our students that are state identified in third through eighth grade. Related arts, physical education, art, music, social emotional learning, of course, special education, ELL services and reading intervention for students that qualify as well. Opportunities for band and chorus, we're pursuing those based upon feedback we receive from families. We're trying to find out the best possible way to be able to continue to offer those to our virtual families as well. So that's why you see an asterisk there. Grade 9 through 12, the specific details for this, you're going to see that there will be, again, South Carolina graduation and South Carolina college entrance will be prioritized. We're really looking at the South Carolina College and Career Readiness requirements for our students to make sure they're on track to graduate. Elective courses will certainly be limited to a degree, but there will be a lot of available courses. 
And before families have to commit, they will have the course guides for the five virtual program shared with them before they have to finish their commitment. So they will know exactly which courses are offered through five, our virtual option. And then also, the same here, we're looking to see how we can provide band and course and all these other opportunities, including STEM and IB programs through the virtual environment as well. So we're trying to make sure we can continue to offer those programs to our five students. Additional information that you'll see here, the five students will be able to participate in after-school activities and transportation arrangements for after-school activities, of course, would have to be provided by the family. And we will have a web page. Once our course guide is ready to go next week, we'll have a web page that we'll also put out that can give you more information on five. So now I'm gonna transition and shift into our next phase, which is part two. But before I do, I'd like to take it back to Dr. Melton. Thank you, Mr. Giuliano. Uh, before we advance this, this slide to the next, we wanna make sure that we insert a pause here. Mr. G, if you'll forward to the next slide of the reentry plans, thank you for that. We wanna make sure we pause here because this is where I'm concerned about the divide in our community. The opinions are strong, the passion is high, the emotion is rich. We want to make sure that as we introduce this that I ask you to listen to our story so that then we can further our conversation. Based upon feedback, based upon review of data, available resources, on the 13th, we, I, I'll take responsibility. I felt confident that we could offer a five-day on-site virtual, five-day on-site traditional model. If you've monitored data the way we have, and because of the timing of when board packet is required for us, things have changed. Because things have changed, because we're using information available and taking it with responsibility, you're going to see new content from this portion of the next chapter of this story to include a hybrid model. For those of you that were against hybrid, that wanted five days on site, I ask you, I implore you, listen and help us work through this together. We don't want to have celebrations of one side versus another. We want to have the conversation together. So let us define what we mean by hybrid in School District 5. Mr. G. Thank you, Dr. Melton. So yes, we're going to talk about our hybrid option as well. So what you see in these slides coming forward are work done through the reentry team, which is inclusive of multiple departments. So Office of Instruction, certainly, but then also planning and administration, human resources, communication, and finance and operations, all working together to create this plan that you see. So for the hybrid plan for the start of the 2021 school year, let's talk a little bit about what the hybrid model looks like. A hybrid model is a blend of face-to-face -face instruction and district distance learning. So what you'll have is you'll have students that are divided into two cohorts. And what that does is each cohort would participate in two days of face-to-face -face instruction per week and three days of distance learning per week. One of the cohorts of students, they'd participate in face-to-face -face instruction on Mondays and Tuesdays. And then they would go to Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday for distance learning. And the second cohort would then participate Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays distance learning and face-to-face -face instruction on Thursdays and Fridays. So what does instruction look like during face-to-face -face in the hybrid model? Teachers and students, they'd follow their assigned schedules. The schools would implement the safety procedures outlined in the district reentry plans and students would be assigned to one of the two cohorts, and the number of students on campus would be limited to allow for social distancing. One of the benefits of the hybrid model is reducing the number of students that are in the building at a particular time. So therefore, that would allow for greater social distancing within the school when we have in-person instruction. 
So what does instruction look like during distance learning during, in the hybrid model for the distance learning piece? Students' application of new learning and skills will continue on distance learning days. So new learning and skills would continue on those distance learning days. Some of it would be live instruction. Some of it would be video-based models that students would be able to watch. And we'd have time that teachers have hours dedicated to students that can sign up for extra assistance to be able to assist students based upon the need when they're working on some of those assignments independently. Teachers would take attendance and students are expected to participate in the distance learning activities and certainly participation will be monitored by the school staff. This chart will show you a breakdown of how the differences look based upon grade level. You see for kindergarten and first grade, learning activities will be provided for the students. We are pursuing as a district appropriate device options for kindergarten and first grade. And if we can secure those, then live instruction would be provided on those distance learning days for kindergarten and first grade. Of course, we'll also look at the, developmental, the developmentally appropriate level and age of each child to determine how long, and how, how long a live instruction model can be based upon the age of the child, too. For second through fifth grade, live instruction will be provided on distance learning days. And for sixth through twelfth grade, live instruction will be provided on distance learning instruction on Wednesdays. And then the rest of the days during the week, there'll be pre-planned activities, video lessons and other types of activities for students to participate in, which will include video pre-recorded videos, completing modules, activities, projects, in which students would apply new learning. And again, teachers would be checking in on their students to make sure there is progress on each day. How would the student cohorts be determined? For pre-K through fifth grade, students would be assigned to one of two cohorts by homeroom, and the students would stay with their homeroom the entire day. For our grade levels, such as a fifth grade classroom that may switch classes at times, the teacher would actually switch classes, not the students, in the pre-K through fifth grade model. Not all of our elementary schools have that model. Some of our elementary schools have self-contained classrooms where the teacher stays with that class the entire day. It's based upon the grade level. For sixth through 12th grade, students would be assigned to one of two cohorts based on their last names, and students would follow their assigned schedule based on their course request to make sure they get the courses they requested that fit within their schedule. For our 4K, our preschool students, and this would be 4K also for 3K and our, some of our development, developmentally delayed programs, students would attend face-to-face -face a half a day on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Some students would attend in the morning on those days, and the other half of the students would attend in the afternoon on those days. This would limit the number of students in these 4K classrooms, because they would be half days of face-to-face in-person instruction for our four-year-olds. Learning activities would be sent home on Wednesdays for students to participate in at home, but really a focus on having them in the building in person on four half days during the week. So for our parents to have multiple children in our district, we're going to make sure that we have a request in place that you can have your child within the same cohort to make it easier on your schedules within the hybrid model. So within the survey, the commitment survey that's going to be going out this week, you'll have an opportunity to be able to request that your children are placed in the same cohort if you select the hybrid model. Because of course, families will have the choice between a hybrid model or five, which is our full virtual program. So let's take a look at what the schedule would look like for students. 
You see cohort one on the top, cohort two on the, on the bottom. Monday and Tuesday for in-person for cohort one. Thursday and Friday would be distance learning activities. And then for cohort two, the days are flipped. There would be live distance learning with, with a modified schedule for all students on Wednesdays. What safety procedures and protocols will be followed under the hybrid model? The, the procedures and plans outlined in the reentry plan phase one will continue to be outlined for our phase two as well. The hybrid plan would limit the number of students on campus, which allows for additional ability to be able to socially distance. And then masks. School District 5 will require the use of face coverings for students and staff. The district will provide the face coverings to the staff and for any students that cannot provide one on their own. Face coverings would be worn when they enter and exit and moving throughout the building and during congregated interactions inside and outside the classroom. Students would be able to remove their face covering when they're seated at their workspaces, not when they're moving throughout the classroom. So what happens if students do not participate in distance learning activities? Teachers would take attendance daily and if students are absent, then messages will be sent home to parents and guardians if they did not participate in distance learning. Teachers will ensure that we continue to have two-way communications with families on a weekly basis. Teachers need to hear from families, especially if there's concerns on a particular day. If there's particular reasons why a child may not have gotten to a particular assignment, teachers need to hear from families and vice versa. We need to have that two-way communication. If a student was to be absent for more than three consecutive days, a contact would be made to the parent or guardian. And as a reminder, teachers are checking in daily, but this would be an additional contact if we see within three consecutive days. This would be an additional contact. Teachers would then work with administrators and other schools professional, profess, personnel sorry, to ensure that students meet attendance requirements that are outlined in the Code of, Code of Conduct Handbook, board policies, and state laws. So if teachers have the difficulty reaching a particular student or a family, then we certainly have other staff within our building, such as administrators, such as mental health providers, school psychologists, school counselors, other people that can reach out to families to support them. This is a breakdown of what we've shared thus far that kind of shows you and highlights the differences between a hybrid and five, which is our 100% virtual option. These are the two options that we're proposing that families would have a choice when the commitment survey goes out later this week. The hybrid model, you see that blend of face-to-face -face instruction, two cohorts of students, teachers taking attendance and students participating, participation will be monitored. For five, you notice that this would be exclusive use of technology, but five will have live classroom instruction by school district five teachers. And then also independent work and activities for students. The note that you see at the bottom School District 5 was approved for the 2021 school year to be an e-learning district through the Education Oversight Committee. So we began those plans once we submitted our application. We began these plans for e-learning back in March. We started planning for this. So we were looking ahead to professional development for our teachers, but we also need to make sure our students and our families are prepared and ready for e-learning as well. And e-learning, and these, these terms can be very confusing because there's so many. We have distance learning, we have virtual education, and now we have e-learning. E-learning are for those days such as inclement weather, those short-term, five-day or less, type closures. Where in the past, you've seen on calendars that we have to make up days that we miss based upon a hurricane that may have come through or inclement weather. Now we could have e-learning on those days and no longer have to make up those days on a different day 
because e-learning would take place on those days that students are not in school. So the hybrid plan for the start of the year. This is how we plan to start the 2021 school year, by offering the hybrid model and by offering the full virtual model. Our plan at the moment to transition to face-to-face -face instruction, which would be five days per week, that traditional option, our plan currently is to return to face-to-face -face instruction on October 8th. We will continue to monitor and communicate updates to parents. And you see the asterisk there for October 8th. That would be the beginning of the second, second interim period is when we would start to look to go back to face-to-face -face instruction. But again, communication would certainly be with our parents and our board as well. I'm going to shift into professional development for all models. As I mentioned before, as we started pursuing e-learning, we started planning professional development for our teachers primarily, but then also for students and for our families as well. So we started this process back in March so we could be prepared for this time. We are planning professional development on technology integration because we know it's a key component in the growth of all of our instructional staff throughout the district. So our teachers have six days uh, that begin their contract, which are work days and in-service days. And we plan on having some virtual and small group professional development for teachers on those days. This professional development has actually been prepared this summer by a lot of our digital integration specialists. We have brought them in and paid for them to come in over the summer so they could prepare the professional development. So we'd have that ready for our teachers upon return. We also have our academic recovery camp for our kindergarten through third grade students that is currently taking place. And we have trained them to make sure that they can provide virtual instruction as well as face-to-face -face instruction. So a lot of that training we've already been able to utilize within our academic recovery camp this summer. Expectations for professional development for successful implementation of e-learning and distance learning scheduled throughout the year will be shared. And we need to make sure that teachers are required to participate in technology integration PD, but they'll also have a menu of choices. As with anybody, anyone has different levels of skills when it comes to many things, but including the use of technology and the use of being able to provide learning in a, in a virtual platform. So certainly we have teachers and staff at varying levels as well. So we will have some professional development for all of our staff so we can have a common theme, a common message, so all of our staff is prepared. But then we're also going to have a menu of choices beyond what's required so teachers will then be able to pick and choose professional development that meets their needs so they can be prepared to be able to deliver the instruction. We are also going to require that our staff, certified staff receive level one Google certification within those six days. And then also during our leap days, for staff that participate in leap days, they'll have a chance to receive professional development as well. Our hashtag lead D5, which is our professional development model, which is teacher led, teacher choice PD, we're going to continue to offer that. And we are working in technology integration to every session that our teachers attend within LEAD D5 throughout the year. And newly approved by the State Department of Education, we can now offer certification renewal credits for our staff for all of the district provided PD that we offer, which is a great bonus that we can now offer those renewal credits. So we're very excited about that. So at this time, Dr. Melton, I'm going to turn it back over to you, and I'll bring up the... If you'll keep the clicker, Mr. G. Take me back to slide 27, just for a point of clarity. The October the 8th date is depending on action of the board. If it is the will of the board to revise the calendar, that is the date at the end of the first interim, uh, um, of the first quarter. So I wanted to make sure we brought that forward as a point of clarity. If the... If the change of the calendar does not happen, we will adjust that accordingly with the previously adopted board calendar 
from earlier this academic, from previously this calendar year. The second point I'd like to make at this slide is if families choose the five model of virtual, they stay in virtual for the duration of the year. This will be for those families that choose to go with a hybrid model. We hope the hybrid is short term and then we get students back on campus for those that choose a traditional model. But those that choose virtual will have access to that for the full academic year of the 2021 year. Mr. G, if you'll advance us now to slide 29. Absolutely. Dr. Melton, may I clarify one point Absolutely. as well, too? Um, with that five model, Dr. Melton mentioned they can stay in it, in it all year, which is true, they can. But after the first semester for secondary, yes. they may choose to opt to go back to the in-person traditional or hybrid, depending on what's taking place at that time. And for elementary students after the first quarter, they may switch programs as well. Just wanted to add that point of clarity. Uh, I'm grateful that you're an active listener. Choice is important. Dynamics change. So we don't want families to feel like they are um, limited to a choice. We will have flexibility to change within the models. Thank you, Mr. G. If you'll advance to slide 29, lots of questions are coming in through our reentry um, address. We felt this is important, but this can also be overwhelming, some of the content that we're sharing, because this is heavily educational jargon. Um, and for this portion, a lot of technology information. The State Department of Education is working with negotiations of a learning management system. Those of you that have watched news across our state, you've heard that South Carolina needs a platform that all districts can have access to. So we've listed for you some of the products that are out there that the State Department of Education is involved with. School District 5 is not uh, uniquely involved with that, but we will take advantage of what the state does um, select to, um, to implement. So that's the first piece that we've got there for you to see. The second bullet, obviously the ending of this presentation is very professional development heavy. We've got to make sure that our staff is qualified, confident, and prepared to reach the expectations of our academic program. Irregardless of which model families choose, it will be rigorous. Irregardless. So because of that, we've got to make sure that our faculty and staff are confident, which is why you, say we've, why you hear us, us say we've got choice. Some teachers are very proficient and prepared. Others are in a different place of their confidence. We are going to meet the needs of those teachers depending on where they are with their choice to be involved with that. So the training dates for professional development have yet to be announced by the department regarding that particular platform. Once that's selected, we will get those dates underway. The third bullet, because we are an e-learning district, and remember that's for inclement weather, there was a question earlier what happens if there South Carolina is known for hurricanes, right? So if there's hurricanes, if there's inclement weather, whatever that may be, we will continue operation through an e-learning platform. So we will be participating with regional meetings to make sure year long that we are involved and informed and trained so that we can successfully implement our e-learning expectations. That's the third bullet. During my introduction, you heard me say that 2021 promises to be a marathon, not a sprint. Although I did not cite that text, I did not quote it, I paraphrased, but I will say it's from a book that I trust very much. Mr. Cates, I am prepared for any questions that the board may ask. Our team is here, and I'd like to pause one more time to thank those representatives that are here this evening from reentry and those that are online. They have worked tirelessly. You can't see the faces of our principals, but they too are to be commended for their continued work and their commitment to make sure that School District 5 is prepared to achieve our mission and vision and to make sure that our students can be successful. Mr. Cates. Thank you, Dr. Melton. I'm going to ask board members, if you have a question, if you'll direct that to Dr. Melton, and then uh, she will uh, direct that to the appropriate staff member uh, if she chooses. Are there questions? Uh, Ms. Hutchison. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask about the staffing for the um, for the classes for the for the virtual and then for the hybrid how how we're going to do that with the teachers um, are they sharing loads can you please address that yes ma'am i'll ask dr jakes to weigh in after i get started mr g may want to weigh in as well um, obviously it's all driven by choice Ms. hutchison so depending on what our families choose we're going to staff appropriately um, with a particular course request that we have, whether it's a first grade class or whether it's an advanced class with advanced placement. So we're going to staff it based upon the needs and the request of families. 
Dr. Jakes, from an HR lens, would you contribute for uh, an answer to Ms. Hutchison's question? I will. One of the things you saw in our timeline earlier is that we're talking to our employees about what their preferences are. So we're allowing each employee to make a formal request um, for an online assignment, if that's um, what they see fit, whether that's for a preference or um, a medically documented need. And based on that, we can go through and apply our, um, our staffing decisions. Of course, we will use um, staffing guidelines. We will move forward to meet the needs of students, and we will take all of those pieces into account to make sure that we redistribute our existing resources to meet the needs and ensure that, um, that each of those classes is staffed appropriately. Dr. Jake, thank you. For those of you that may not know Dr. Jake, she's our Chief of Human Resources. From an instructional lens, I've asked Mr. Giuliano to come back to the podium. Mr. G. So within the hybrid model, um, our, our schedules would look very similar to what it would be normal, except you're pretty much taking half the students and putting them on different days. So you would have certainly less students in classes within the hybrid model. And we will have some students participating in the five model. And for full virtual, such as five, you can have some higher class sizes to virtual teachers can teach higher caseloads than an in-person teacher can. It will not be remarkably that much higher, but we can have higher caseloads or case um, students in a virtual platform such as five. But we will have some classes that actually go below in a hybrid model, what we traditionally have because you're gonna have less students in the building. Yes, um, and, and I meant to say this when we started, I suspect all of us will have questions and maybe multiple questions. Uh, if you'll ask a question and if there's an immediate uh, follow-up to that and then uh, I'll ask other board members, I promise I'll get back to you uh, as, we, as we each uh, take a turn here. Ms. Hammond. Yes, and mine um, goes along with Ms. Hutchinson's. Um, will teachers that make the choice for virtual would they be leaving their home school and then when it gets back to normal, if they want to go back to their home school, will the teacher have that right? Um, staffing, of course, as you know, Ms. Hammond, is based upon the needs of the student and the enrollment of the school. Uh, Dr. Jakes, I'm going to ask you to weigh in on that because, of course, the choice of who participates, and I'll, I'll use an example, some of the advanced classes of statistics and probability. If we have a class like that, we certainly can pull from across the district to make up the class that's that specialized. So we may need to pull a teacher into that environment. And then once we have gone back, we'll make sure that teacher gets the assignment as appropriate. It doesn't necessarily mean back at the school where they're originally assigned, but when teachers sign contracts, they are signed as employees of the district. And then of course we place. Dr. Jakes, what would you like to add as Chief of Human Resources to that response? Sure, I've um, certainly, um would echo everything that, that you've shared. In addition to that, I'd just like to cite that we always make every opportunity to consider the needs of the teacher as well as the request of the teacher. And we're always going to do that um, in a collaborative fashion. At the end of the day, we are compelled to um, make the decision that best needs, meets the needs of students, but we will always be respectful um, of our teacher request and make every effort um, to work with them on those requests. Dr. Melton, along with this, have you, is this going to be, or have you already requested which teachers would like to do virtual? Yes, ma'am, thank you for that. Dr. Jakes, just in case you may not have heard, I'm checking volume to make sure that, I'm not sure that I'm being picked up either. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, Dr. Jakes, yes, ma'am. So, Ms. Hamlin, would you like to repeat your question, make sure I Dr. Will. Jakes heard it? Um, I was, let's see, I'd already, did y'all hear me when I asked about Dr. Jakes, you heard me when I asked if the teacher would return to their home school, right? Yes, ma'am. We I think we answered that one. If, if we didn't clarify, we certainly can follow up. Well, I, and I guess I was asking, have we? Ha, is this going to be, or have you already started um, polling our teachers and knowing who would prefer the hybrid and who would prefer the um, virtual? Yes, ma'am. Dr. Jakes, can you talk about our timeline? I sure will. This week, we opened up a survey where we did begin polling to ask that question so that we could get preliminary numbers. 
But following that, one of the things we had on the um, the timeline for the following week is to communicate with employees to give them access to a direct system that allows them to make the formal request to teach online. We've designed that um, along the lines of our um, highly successful transfer process. We've done that electronically for several years. Our teachers are familiar with that process. Last year, we had a video uh, where we talked about that um, as a retention measure to make sure that, stu that um, teachers' voices are heard. We're going to utilize a very similar system, and every teacher will have the opportunity to access that electronic site and make that formal request for an online assignment. All right, thank you, Mr. Loveless. Yes, um, there's a divide from what I've seen in the community based on, you know, some people w want to do the virtual and hybrid models, but they don't have inter internet access. And I know that I think that the district is going to receive $1.6 million in CARES Act money from the federal government. And I read that. And I was wondering, are we doing anything to help provide internet access to the families that don't have it? Yes, sir. Thank you for the question. I'm going to look to either Director Garris or Mr. Richardson. Uh, that's nearly probably a two-pronged. So, Mr. Richardson, if you'll come to the microphone first. Uh, Mr. Lovis, for obviously you're aware of the fundings that we have. Funds are coming available, but to make sure that those that are listening in are aware, there are a variety of um, funds that are coming with COVID-19. So, Mr. Richardson, if you'll take the piece of that first, and because of your supervision of technology, you may feel comfortable answering the question about the digital divide and access of um, devices, but also access of internet active uh, opportunities to our students. Uh, thank you, Dr. Melton. Uh, and it was difficult for me here to question, so, but I think you were referring to the $1.6 million of the, what we call the ESSER funds, which was the, <clears throat> the money we received. We have received that. What we did um, was use that money to pay for the salaries of those, that, those staff members in the district that could not work virtually from home. It helped us implementing the, the emergency, what I call the emergency meal delivery and, um, and pickup sites. Um, it helped us pay and keep our bus drivers and our custodians employed while we were out. But it also freed up other resources so that we would have the ability to go out and purchase um, PPEs, those type of things that we needed to perform our jobs as well. The second part of that question had to do with internet access. Yes, I was wondering whether there are, I mean, it may, may not be under the CARES Act. It may be some other act that I know there were three acts passed. And I was just wondering, or is there federal funds, you know, because this, this is, uh, I know we received one, um, one comment that, you know, that, that the, the parent would, was scared to death to go back to school, but they don't have internet access. So they can't, they can't do anything but face to face and they can't do the, uh, the hybrid model either. So I was just wondering, is there, are there funds that we could capture to do something about that? Well, that's a, that's a very good question, and I don't know the I do, well, let me answer the question. It may not be what you want me to yeah. answer, or how you want me to answer it, but there is money available. Um, however, it's, from my understanding, it's being dispersed based on poverty. Um, any district that's 85 or 88 percent poverty or above are gonna get first, shot of that money. Um, so most of your rural districts will get that. I'm not sure how much will be left. If they don't use it all, I don't know how much will be left for our district. Um, what they were doing is providing hotspots um, for those students that did not have internet access. But that's all we know so far. And Mr. Lovis, for a point of clarity, I'm not sure Ms. Richardson or Ms. Dir Director Garris would like to uh, weigh in on this. We're also looking at available resources not necessarily new funds, but how might we open up some of our access? Uh, Ms. Richardson, would you like to answer that about on-site and availability of guests, or would you prefer Ms. Garris come and answer that question as Director of Technology? I, I'll, I'll try to answer it, and, and, and hopefully she'll correct me if I say something wrong. <laughs> um, what, what we've talked about is, um, well, students already have access to our Wi-Fi, so you know, hopefully if there are some students that do not have access from home, if they have a way to get to a location, we hope to be able to provide space for them to have internet access. Even some, in, even some of our schools, even in the parking lots, um, we, we have some Wi-Fi capability as well. Uh, just as a follow-up, I'm I, I just wondering, you know, I, I'm sure we are, but 
Are we working on places that, that children could go after school for, you know, uh, in conjunction with, with uh, churches and things like that so that they could get to a place where, where they could, you know, have internet access? I'm, I, I know we're going to be cleaning schools after school, so we're not going to be able to, you know, to use the, the buildings for that. So just a question. I mean, you know. Would you like me to respond to that as well? If I may lead in, and then you actually had a call about that today, didn't you? I did. Um, we want to, this is a great opportunity, Mr. Lovis, that we can extend to our community what new partners may be out there that would be interested to offer such an engagement and partnership with us. So that would be my first request to our community. Who might be out there that's interested that we've not heard from already or that we've not reached out to already? Ms. Richardson actually had a call recently as today. So Ms. Richardson, would you take that and respond with our efforts currently? Sure, I had a conversation. I, um, you may or may not know, but um, our Mo Chapin Recreation Commission runs several uh, after school programs across our district. And so um, you know, we reached out to them to have a discussion about whether or not they would be willing to uh, continue that during this COVID issue. They've, been, they've actually run two programs where they've utilized our facilities um, during the summer because of the daycare shortage. They, had, they felt like they had to run some programs there so the parents would have some options for um, um, daycare, basically. But um, anyway, um, we've talked with them. They are willing to continue to operate these after-school programs um, as long as we're capable of providing space for them. They will do that. So we, w we do have that option. Now, that is not every school, but that is, I think, six schools is what, how many they are serving right now. Thank you. I'm going to go to Mr. Gant. Thank you, Mr. Chate and um, the board and community. I wanted to thank Dr. Melton and her staff for this update. <clears throat> we realize this is a very fluid situation, a very fluid pandemic that we're in, and, and I want to thank you for that. I think what we're really talking about how is how we can safely open our schools, hopefully, and especially if we amend our calendar a few minutes, by the 8th of September. <clears throat> and I, I don't want us to lose sight. There's much concern on this board and in this community and in every parent, uh, every household in our community about the health and well-being of our students and our teachers. And I, I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that our state is a current hot spot for COVID positive cases and also hospitalizations. And, and my hope is that that number will start to decrease. <clears throat> but this, there are things that have got to happen. I talked with Dr. Melton yesterday. We had a great conversation about this and other things. But my hope is by the middle of next month or close to the time that we would have to make a final decision we'd see a, a change in those numbers to have gone down significantly. Something that the CDC and DHEC in our state would say, this is a safe and acceptable place to be to reopen schools. I, I have been amazed. I've served on this board many years. I've been amazed by the outpouring, the information that has been offered by parents, by the community, and they've shared, they've shared with us their concerns and their wishes for how we can reopen. But I would just say that I know this board very well. I know this community very well. And I know that safety of our teachers and our students and our community has got to be foremost in whatever decision that we might make. With that as a, as a backdrop, I want to go back to Dr. Jake, if I well, I'll go to Dr. Melton, uh, Mr. Cates, Chairman Cates, sorry. But just for a clarification, I know that a survey went out yesterday. And I, she may have answered this. I might not have exactly heard it right. But I would assume if a teacher has made a, already made a choice, that, that there may be some adjustment that teacher might want to make at this point. We now have a, a hybrid plan that is part of hybrid or virtual it didn't really exist in that teacher's mind when that survey went out yesterday. So I would like to hope that we'll give every teacher that has already made a decision. And our teachers are the best. We know that they probably, a lot of them made an immediate decision, but I'd like to know if Dr. Jakes could tell us how that might work in this scenario, since we do have a different 
a slightly different plan on the table at this time. Dr. Miller. Mr. Cates, if I may intro to that, then I'll ask Dr. Jakes to weigh in. Uh, the survey, of course, is still open, and although a staff member may have submitted a survey response, at any time their situation and dynamics may change. I commend our Human Resources Department for their continued support of outreach from our employees to us. Dr. Jakes and her entire team have practiced what I believe to be exemplary customer service to our staff. Dr. Jakes, if you would respond to the question regarding surveys, the window, but also if someone's made a submission and how we would honor the fact that there may need to be requested changes. Absolutely, Dr. Melton. What um, is available now and will be available um, through the middle of next week is actually a survey. And that is just to give us preliminary data as we work with instruction and plan for staffing. But following the close of that survey, we will actually um, issue another communication to staff members that allows them to make their formal request. Right now, we're simply getting survey information about where they stand on a variety of issues, including a desire to teach virtually. But once we open up that window, they will be able to go in and officially make that request. And after that, they make that a, a request, they could still request a change at that point. So yes, sir, we will absolutely work individually with our teachers as we move forward. Thank you, Dr. Jakes. Thank you. Other questions? Ms. Gardner. Um, I asked this question last board meeting, so I just wanted to clarify this time too. Um, for this hybrid model, we will be having um, teachers that are in the building with classrooms, basically two sets of classes, and then our distance learning will be another set of teachers that possibly could handle more students. Is that what I was hearing? Yes, ma'am, and I'll ask Mr. Giuliano if he'd come to the microphone for that. Um, for, as far as class size for our five program, that can be higher than the average class size or outside of policy, perhaps, but there also may be some opportunities or classes that would require a lower class size than policy. Mr. Giuliano is Chief Instructional Officer. So what we're trying to do that for, for five, yes, the class size can be higher for those five students, but in the hybrid model, we know that we're trying to transition into a traditional model. We need to be able to keep schedules as easily, um, so we, when we transition between hybrid and traditional, it can be as easy and smooth as possible. So the teachers will actually be teaching their groups of students in the hybrid model, both face-to-face -face and distance learning. So when we do eventually return to traditional, they still have the same groups of students when they come back. Yes, so at, just, as clear, just to clarify, as I guess, question, that's what I was concerned about is this, the, there wouldn't be teachers just doing distance learning. They were the same teachers that are teaching face-to-face -face. because if we transfer, you know, what happens to those teachers who, do they suddenly not have a job anymore, but it's not a separate set of teachers. It's the same teacher. Okay, thank you for that clarification, Ms. Gardner. Teachers will be assigned based upon their, based upon our student interest and the needs of enrollment. So. We're not going to have a reduction of numbers of students. So that the staffing is driven by enrollment. And then, of course, Dr. Jakes would say our certified staff um, that have continuing contracts. So we're not looking at unemployment of folks. We may be looking at movement if we were to have students that leave the five model of the complete virtual experience to return to the on-site traditional. When we move out of hybrid into a traditional five-day back in a normal situation and we still have students that are in five, we've got to constantly monitor to see what we might do. For our teachers that are participating in the five model, Mr. G, talk a little bit about that so that if Dr. Jakes is describing where teachers are going to be placed based upon selections of students, talk a little bit about where we may need to have teachers to be and how that assignment will look of their workload. So our teachers in our five model, they will be teaching full days just like they would if they were teaching in person. It'd be a full day for our teachers within five and they'll have the same number of courses that they would typically have in person as well. So they'll be teaching live instruction, but then they'll also have some time to be able to assist the students in quote unquote office hours so they can assist students when they need additional assistance with some of their independent projects that they're working on or some of the assignments they're working on collectively. 
So the day for the teacher in the, in the five model is gonna look very similar to the day of the in-person. The, the biggest difference is their students will all be virtual. Just a follow-up comment. Um, I've heard from many teachers. I have quite a few teacher friends, and um, many of them have felt that they haven't been asked what they thought or what they, what they would like. And so I appreciate that the surveys are finally going out and that they're asking. But I just want to ask formally if we can do a better job of letting the teachers know that we think they're valuable and loved. And I know we already think that. I, I mean, I know, I know that we all think that, but I don't know if they're, they're feeling it or hearing it right now. So that's just my request. Thanks. Mr. White, I can't see you, but I... A couple of questions. Um, is this on? Okay. Yeah. Uh, the original model or original plan was a five-day face-to-face uh, and then a virtual but there's no hybrid option, and, and I think, if I recall correctly, that was because all the input you'd gotten at that point was either or. There wasn't a lot in between for hybrid. Well, I, I can't speak for the engagement of input at that point. When we were working with committees, the available data that we had at that point, the information we had, we were comfortable introducing that. But at that point, the 13th of July, when I introduced it, I did not introduce it as a commitment as to what we were going to be doing with choice at the point of families and staff making decisions. So because since that time of the 13th, data has changed, Dr. Harris, of course, with monitoring of our zip codes in our school district, information that we've gotten, there has been some perceptive data of opinions, and there has been quantity of data of um, numeric value that we need to consider. So we wanted to have the first introduction of we're looking at two options to make sure that we started to message there will be choice, choice for families, choice for the models, that there would not be 100% virtual. But based upon some changes we've had of case information and um, positive cases, it's important that we make this change at this point to work within the window of time so that families have time to be prepared. So, so this, this whole process is a fluid process yes, to a degree, but the, the, the other thing, question about the original discussion on the 13th, did, did I hear correctly that it's not practical or cost effective to have all three options together? You couldn't run face-to-face, -face, five days, hybrid and virtual? That was just going to overload the resources? To me, it wasn't about cost, it was about resources. So based upon the current staff that we have to be able to manage the program, the more options we offer, the more strain that puts on our faculty and staff, the more preps that we call in education that would be for teachers to have to respond to. So the more models we add, the more that takes towards away from the effectiveness of how we're trying to implement. Because we, and resources, we can't just go even if we have the money, we just can't go add a bunch of teachers. I mean, Correct. we have yes, the sir. teachers we have, and that's probably it till the next year. So when we start with a hybrid, and then on October 8th, are we going back to strictly face-to-face -face virtual? So no hybrid at that point? We would hope that there's no hybrid at that point, but it would be hinging on the number of cases we have in our community, where we are as a, a health-related community at that point. But once we go back from hybrid to on-site traditional, it would be five days. So once the data supports five day, it's five day, it's, a, it's the original plan again. Yes, for sir. Everybody. Either, either or five day face-to-face -face or virtual. But unfortunately with the disclaimer that if there were to be another um, spike in data. You might have to go back. You may have to go back or you may have to go to the extreme, the way like things virtual. were back in March when government master check closed us by executive order. Right. So, uh, sorry, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, we all got a lot of emails the last few days. Uh, it was kind of amazing. I think it was about every 45 seconds the, the email <laughs> inbox would ping. But, um, and there were a lot of impressive views. There were a lot of views. I, I think we, we, we had views from almost every perspective I could imagine. But one of them that I was really impressed with or, or I found fascinating was somebody who described a process they were actually working in a senior living facility and all the safety precautions and protocols and I know you pass it on to the nurses but do, do we have that kind of depth 
you know, protocols for procedures and processes and, you know, nurses and other people that are, that are I mean, it sounded very sophisticated. I know you were getting input, but where, where are we? I mean, I was just fishing around on the Internet just now. I, I couldn't see a lot, not as much as what I heard this individual describing, but it seems we need to develop along a pathway something like that to have that kind of sophistication and protocol. Is that where we're heading, or where, is there anything you can comment on about what's in place today or where you're moving? Uh, I can say what we've done thus far and what we're moving towards. We have operated on site for high school, summer school, supervised by Dr. Harris, middle school, summer school, uh, Mr. Giuliano is chief instructional officer, and we currently have academic recovery camp on site for elementary school students. So we have been practicing the protocols within an educational setting to include social distancing. I commend Director Cannon. He's actually gone out into schools and he and his staff have measured. We set up model classrooms. We are practicing the protocols as um, responsible operation would be. Now, where we would go in towards sophistication, we're fortunate to have nurses employed in School District 5. But if this were an economic year that we could ask for additional FTEs, that would be a need for School District 5. I think Dr. Harris would share because we need more nurses to have available. If we, once we start operation the way we have this summer, if we have a nurse become ill, we have um, a limited amount of nurses that could cover for another. So towards sophistication, we could always use more FTEs, but if you've noticed in our budget request, we've not made that request because we are very sensitive economically to what's happening. The sophistication towards environment, uh, Mr. Cannon and his team have tried to continue to make sure that we have the resources of cleaning equipment, but also the cleaning materials and training. He and Dr. Jakes have worked towards the training of our facility supervisors, our staff that have been on site, and then we of course have a plan to continue to train. We've got to make sure that teachers and staff are comfortable as they resume back on campus. So I, I fear that sophistication may be subjective, but I, I would say that we've been responsible and responsive as we tried to prepare to be proactive. And, and what, what's the piece with, um, and I just heard you describe a lot, the sound like social distancing and disinfecting, et cetera, but what's the piece or the protocols is there's a detection of a case or there's a suspected case and, and somebody's in the nurse's station, I mean, is there contact tracing, is there isolation? Where, where, I, mean, where, I mean, I know you may not be totally mature in what your protocols are, oh, but we've where, had where practice. are we today? And, and <laughs> I, I can say, and I'll ask Dr. Harris if he would come the to the microphone, now? and it's in the plan. Dr. Jakes could also weigh in. Um, with, within our nursing environment, Dr. Harris and our lead nurse Richards have got some protocols in place. We've already had some that we have had to be um, responsive to that have been cases. So Dr. Harris, if you would talk about our protocols regarding the operations through a health lens, and then I'll ask Dr. Jakes to weigh in from a PR, uh, from a um, personnel side of things. Absolutely, and great question. And I will simply say um, thank you for the acknowledgement of, of nurses and the need for nurses and the services that they bring to us here in School District 5. Um, certainly invaluable, and uh, we are very appreciative of what they do. Uh, we continue to daily expand upon what we try to do in terms of services for our students and staff here in the school district. But I can tell you, as Dr. Melton said, we've had a number of, of opportunities already uh, to practice um, uh, addressing situations when we are, when we are at least notified uh, that a staff or a student has um, uh, contracted COVID-19 or uh, family members, for example, have con contracted um, COVID-19. Uh, the long short of the answer, Mr. White, is that we're going to follow very, very closely uh, the guidelines that are provided by DHEC and CDC. Uh, we have put those measures in place. We have uh, been in constant contact with DHEC on uh, every case that we have, every case that we know of, we have made contact with DHEC. We have also consulted legal counsel to assist us. Uh, all of the things in terms of contract tracing, those things, many of which have been employed or have been um, uh, implemented by DHEC on that particular end, uh, those things are in place. Uh, there is a protocol an itemized protocol that we have uh, put in place with uh, HR. I see Dr. Jake Stair is going to kind of jump in here in just a second, where we are working hand in hand uh, together and making certain that we are addressing uh, those cases as they occur. Uh, so we feel very good about where we are, I can tell you, and you've, we've, we've said it a number of times, we'll continue to say it. It is ever evolving. As we learn more, uh, we're going to implement and we're going to, we're going to implement more. And so I'll pause there for just a second, um, yield to Dr. Jakes, but for the long short, it's 
precisely the prescription uh, as provided by um, DHEC is what we're following at this particular time. So can I ask another question? If could Dr. Jakes weigh in on that, if you don't mind first, Dr. Jakes. Sure. So um, I absolutely support what Dr. Harris shared. And we do look at this through two, um, two lenses. Dr. Harris looks specifically at students. I look specifically at staff with my benefits team. And there is absolute comfort in having the DHEC protocol ac access to experts at DHEC. And we absolutely follow that guidance um, at every step and every turn. Thank you. Uh I worry, Dr. Melton, about, for lack of a better descriptor that comes to mind, are some of our subgroups. We have a high percentage in District 5 of students that take AP and IB, and I know those exams we don't really have any control over. That's, that's College Board and then the IB, and then, uh, so I worry about the access they have to those classes. I worry about our students that um, you know, our Kate Center is so uh, popular, our students being able to do some of the hands-on learning that's involved. And then kind of that third group that, that I've really been concerned about is our special needs students, uh, the services that um, we often either refer in or bring in, the day-to-day -day contact that uh, they need. So those are kind of, uh, again, uh, there may be a better way to describe that, but those, those groups within our whole that, that I'd like to try to address a little bit. So when, AP. I'm not sure. That, so the question was yeah, for Mr. Giuliano, yeah. our chief of instruction, to so come to the microphone. Be, and then Dr. Slatton, our director of uh, special services, uh, is on stage, I see. So um, Dr. Mr. Giuliano, if you'll talk a little bit about those particular portions of our academic program of AP and IB, which I consider to be advanced placement courses for those that may be listening in that don't understand some of the lingo that we have, but also the career and technical educational path. When we say that we've been working on the course guide for our five program, that's, that's primarily elementary, intermediate, middle is a lot easier than the high school model. So that the high school has taken us a little bit more time because we want to be able to offer all of those opportunities for our students. So we've worked very closely with our school counselors, guidance department, with school principals, assistant principals for instruction, so we can have a course guide per school at the high school level so we can try to offer to our five students advanced placement classes, IB classes, STEM classes, all those opportunities, ALA, like you're mentioning, so they can continue to be offered in our five program. Because if they decide after the semester that they wanna come back to in-person or hybrid or whatever we have at that time, we want them to be prepared and ready to get right back into that instruction. So yes, we are working hard with the schools now. And really that's the part we're on now is we're finalizing the high school part so we can offer those advanced opportunities to all of our students, even if they select the five model. So in a statement of reassurance that I'll ask Dr. Slatton if she'll start making her way, uh, although she reports to Mr. Giuliano, I suspect her name and voice will bring a little bit of comfort to our families of students with special needs. To summarize that, Mr. Giuliano, our commitment is to offer a rigorous academic program without compromising advanced placement nor specialized courses. That's correct. We are gonna try to offer every single class we can and if there is a particular class, I'll use cosmetology as an example, they have to have some face-to-face -face interaction in cosmetology in order to get their certificate. So for those particular opportunities, we don't have a way to offer that 100% virtually. We cannot offer cosmetology 100% virtually. But a family that selects five will give them an opportunity to still take cosmetology by working it in their schedule but they would have to go face to face. So we're trying every possible way to get every course students need. And when we can, we have, may have to be creative with some in-person opportunities as well. And to make sure we provide context, that cosmetology as an example, those parameters out, are outside of school district five mm -hmm. influence and decision-making. So we're having to be in compliance with courses such as those specialties. Yes. 
Dr. Slatton, thank you for being here tonight as our Director of Special Services. If you could talk some about our children with special needs and how we're supporting those families in their academic efforts. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, we have been working diligently, and I just want to say first and foremost to thank our parents who have reached out to us in the reentry um, through the reentry email process and also through our office. They have been absolutely 100% um, our partners in this process as we've as we're creating our new plan. So, so thank them to those who are listening tonight. We are working diligently in, on several fronts, and I could talk for about 20 minutes, but I know that you don't want me to do that. Um, we have, one of the things that will happen for all of our students that are served with special needs, we will have what is called a distance learning plan that will be a part of their individual education plan that will be developed in partnership with the parents upon the return of our staff. So we will have a plan for e-learning, distance learning for every single student that served under special education. We're working now to see what those will look like and developing those. We've had some teachers that have gone above and beyond to come in and help us develop plans for what that distance learning will look like and how we best serve our students in, the, in, in, in those models. We also have teams of teachers that are working with our staff to develop what five will look like for our students with disabilities who are not able to come back to school full time due to medical reasons or for health concerns or because of family choice. So we will have, um, Students that are in general education most of the day, we will have a plan for them. Students who need more of a self-contained model and are with their special education teachers more often, we'll have a plan for them. Um, the other thing that we're looking at is for our students that have related services such as speech, OT, physical therapy, how do we ensure that the students are getting the, the maximum number of services possible within these different models? So, Ultimately, though, as you know, each of the plans for each student will come back to the individual needs of that child and as those teams develop what services those children need. So there will be a lot of meetings, unfortunately, that will be held, but that will give us an opportunity to work with our staff and with our parents to develop the best programs possible for our students. Thank you. Then the, my last question, the, um, you know, seat time is really driven by the State Department of Education. Are they showing any willingness uh, to relax that seat time? And kind of along with that, often we have our seniors get to that place in their um, senior year where maybe they took a class online virtually one summer and um, they maybe they did an early birth. All of a sudden, they only need four or five classes to graduate. However, our requirement and then partly the state's requirement is for a certain number of classes. So is that decisions we can make at the local level or are those issues we have to wait for direction from the state? Uh, I'll look to Director Holden to come forward and Mr. Giuliano may would like to weigh in. Of course, seat time is a requirement as uh, Chairman Kate said from the State Department of Education. The last time we met on the 13th of July, you heard me say that we were seeking waivers, and um, Superintendent Spearman, of course, has taken that with her initiative. Director Holden, if you could offer an update from Accountability and Administration. Uh, we have not received any official clarification yet on whether or not we'll receive a uh, waiver or waivers are being granted for that piece, uh, but we are still monitoring that as part of our accountability meetings with the state. Um, much of their communication recently is focused on testing and that type of information that's being passed down from the state, but we're trying to get clarification on other pieces there as well. Of course, with the distance learning model uh, and it being implemented the way it is, uh, that, that is expected to be, uh, students are expected to attend and participate in that, and that is treated as a distance learning day, and students are actively engaged in that piece. And Mr. Holden, if you'll stay there, for a student that may be a senior in a scenario that you just described, Mr. Cates, with our local policies that require the classes on site, if we see that we need like to wait that or need to wait that, but I need to assert the fact that funding follows students, so we need students to be enrolled with us for the percentage that we're required to have per state funding guidelines. Mr. Holt, anything you'd like to add to that, or Mr. Richardson from financial angle that you'd like to add just for overview of information regarding the on-site responsibilities of a senior that may have been very successful with their academic career to this point? No, ma'am, I think you've, you've pretty much covered it there, uh, but we do want to ensure that students are able to meet their graduation requirements. We want to make sure that we are providing them with what they're going to need uh, and that the, the uh, practices that we're adopting aren't going to inhibit a student from uh, successfully graduating or becoming college and career ready. 
I'll look to Mr. Richardson to see if there's anything he'd like to add from the financial, okay? Mr. Loveless. Uh, one thing that, that I have fielded a lot of questions about from employees that have, you know, just sent uh, emails and so forth is about um, Smogger's Board insurance that comes along with, you know, uh, the district offers the, you know, the normal insurance. And then you can always, as a small business person, you can, the person that's out there can purchase Smogger's Board. It might be short-term disability, it might be a cancer policy, whatever. But they're asking the question, does, you know, with the economies of scale that the district has, and, and I don't know public finance, so I don't know how that works, but can they purchase um, the short-term disability policy in case they get sick at home and, you know, you know things go along and they don't realize it and they, and they, and they actually became ill at home? What, what is the, what, how do we do that? Thank you, Mr. Lovelace, for that question. And Dr. Jakes, that's under benefits. That's your supervision. As Chief of Human Resources, if you would weigh in on that, then Mr. Richardson may like to weigh in from an insurance um, side of things for liability. So I'll let to Dr. Jakes first. Certainly. Um, so our state benefits program is one of the most attractive um, tools we have for recruitment. And so our state benefits program does offer health, dental, vision, long-term disability, and life insurance for our full-time employees. And for our part-time employees, they have health, dental, and vision. But in, uh, in addition to those benefits, our supplemental carrier is Colonial Life. And through Colonial Life, we do have that large-scale access to short-term disability, life insurance, a cancer plan, as you mentioned, and other benefits, of course, for our employees involve medical and dependent daycare accounts, as well as 401k opportunities. And I would encourage any employee with any questions whatsoever to always reach out individually um, to our benefits department. Um, we regularly um, counsel and provide access to those services and um, have experts in that department who are well-versed with assisting employees. We would love to to help them um, with any questions of that nature. Thank you, Dr. Jakes. And I'll look now to Mr. Richardson. Uh, his responsibilities to, are inclusive of monitoring liability and insurance that is required for the safety of, of our environment. Mr. Richardson. And, and I'm sorry, I have difficulty hearing what the, the exact question was, but um, what Dr. Jakes, um, I, to I totally agree with, and there we do have obviously a lot of options on what employees can do to purchase. However, there's really no kind of district coverage to cover us in the event of, you know, someone contracting this right now. We've even had rulings that um, you, you can't even file a workers' comp claim um, should you contract it at work. So, so am I hearing this right, that, there, that, there, that the employee can at present purchase short-term disability insurance? We have that option available. Now, whether or not you can go out now and get it and be covered for something like that, I don't know that answer Okay, because what you're saying is sort of like an inevitability, or it could be, it could be ruled to be that. Like, it'd be like get, purchasing hurricane insurance when there's a hurricane on the way. Right, right. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, but those people that are already you know, that already have that need to check, to probably check their policies. There are some secondary policies and um, I don't, you know, we, and I don't think this, I'll, I'll mention this, but I don't think it applies in this case that we also purchase compulsory uh, student accident insurance, but I don't think it would cover any type of illness like this for students. Thank you. Ms. Hammond. Thank you. Um, if it's okay, I have three teacher oriented questions. Um, for Dr. Melton, um, and I, I know I've answered, and many of you have too, probably many emails about standing strongly as a teacher that I do want to say publicly that we all know there is no, um, you know, substitute for a five-day classroom teacher, both for learning and mental and social um, interaction is so important. And I really um, feel like there's so many and, and our teachers will rise to the occasion, but I have three things I did want to ask. One, have we planned, do we have anything in place as a district that could help teachers that when they are virtually teaching and yet they have small children at home that are school age, but they're not in school. So they're, they're having, 
I mean, and that's hard, and I know parents have it, but I'm, I'm doing the teacher thing now because I feel like maybe we as a district, Dr. Melton, could, I don't know whether we could have sort of a, a, a even if we hired babysitters to help those teachers that have these small children, but their, their job is to teach and they're at home if they're the virtual. Um, but some type of, of uh, support, I just wanted to ask that. And then my other one was, and I might have gotten this down wrong because I don't have a, a hard copy of it, but um, the training for teachers. I'm sure we're going to do Google tools and the different things that's going to help with distance learning because I know for Lexington too, as a teacher, I've been taking courses all of July. We do it online, but and we are compensated for it as work. But I was wondering, are we could we do anything to help train our teachers even in August from home and be able to pay them for that? Um, you know, that's not an in-service day, which they're paid for. But if, could we look at, if they need it, and maybe, maybe you've got all these virtual teachers that have volunteered and they're like really good at it, and they really don't need training. But I can tell you there are teachers that do to do it the way we need to do it for kids. Um, and then my third one is just to go back over the leap days since, you know, we're going to change the starting, if you don't mind addressing that, and what teachers would be doing on those leap days, if that's changed from, from, from your answer that we got on the 13th. Okay, thank, th you. thank you, Ms. Hammond. I'll ask Dr. Jakes to weigh in on the first one, and Ms. Richardson may be interested as well. When it comes to um, child care support of our teachers, we have to be careful with liability. Okay. If we take on the supervision of children of teachers that may not be enrolled in school, that will create an additional um, carrier issue for us as a district. So I think that point needs to be of note. The second one is, if we're going to provide child care to teachers' children, then why would we not have our own students on site? So that could create a perception issue that we're having more people on campus or available, how we would then manage the perception and the support of our families who are just as, as much and need problem, and under yeah. as much stress as our staff may be. So I'd, I'd like to insert that caveat before I look to Dr. Jakes to see if there's anything she'd like to add. Um, just to echo what Dr. Melton said, but um, just to reiterate that um, we do um, have that uh, that benefit that I mentioned earlier that we do have the dependent care accounts. And so teachers or staff members who need child care or need to exercise that do have that tax benefit. And we do have a number of um, teachers who use that, but we do not have a formal mechanism to assist with child care. The second question I heard Ms. Hammond was regarding distance learning. I'll ask Mr. Giuliano to come to the microphone to review with everyone what our supportive teachers would be for distance learning. I think it's important to insert all teachers will have an interaction of some sort of expectation of distance learning. Knowing that we're an e-learning district as approved by the Education Oversight Committee, so whether you're full-time with five or whether you're in another position of the other model, we do have the expectation for all teachers. Mr. G. Yes, yeah, so all of our teachers are planned to receive professional development so they're prepared for distance learning and for virtual learning um, when they return from their contracts, but then also utilizing that through our leap days as well. Teachers on leap days will teach some students, but when they're not teaching students, we're also gonna offer professional development on those days. So they'll be having professional development on some of that Google platform that you mentioned and some of the other key components so they're prepared for virtual and distance learning. Mr. G, while you're at the microphone, talk a little bit more about LEAP. Um, and for the audience and to remind, we found so many jargons and acronyms at the board. Remind everyone what LEAP is for, the intention of it, and the funding source of that. So the intention of LEAP Days originally was for face-to-face -face instruction for pre-K through eighth grade. The state has now come out and said that we may offer it to our virtual students, the ones that select five as well. So that just came out last week, so we're going to be making that adjustment very soon. But originally it was for pre-K through eighth grade, it still is, and originally it was for face-to-face. -face. We will bring in identified students on different days based upon the schools, and the schools will identify students for each day. We will offer it to every student in our district at least one day for LEAP. So at least one day will be offered to every student, but they do not have to accept it if they do not want to accept it. And our teachers are not under contract at that time, so we cannot make them come in during those five days. But if they do come in, 
to participate, then we'll have the professional development for them when they're not teaching students at that time as well. Thank you. Mr. Lovis. This is my last question. <laughs> I'm sure you're happy about that. But um, the, are there plans to counsel the families on the re which reentry plan is best for them? I mean, how, if, if you've got, you know, the ball's up in the air and you've got three kids and each one of them is, is in a different phase of, uh, of their school careers, you know, is there plans to try to do that? I would hope from a couple of um, angles, Mr. Lovelace, Dr. Harris and his social worker team, I think they would be of direct access, our parent educators. I would encourage any family that is um, indecisive or is seeking some advice to reach out to them. In addition to that, Dr. Slatton supervises our school psychologist. They would be available to offer family support. And of course, always our guidance departments. Our guidance counselors know our children and our families very well. Those that may be transitioning from one school to another, it's okay to reach out to the school that your child may be leaving. So if I'm leaving fifth grade of an elementary school or fourth grade of an elementary school, transitioning to another school, where you may not know the guidance staff well enough to help make that decision of that child of yours, reach out to the counselors that you may support if you would like assistance. Our teachers always have insight that um, helps families with broadening their perspective of how children do. So I would hope that our teachers will be available to that. But as far as the specialists that we would have, our school administrators would be available because of their work during the summer. Our teachers may not be email active, but I think many of our families have access to our teachers via email, via social media. Many have given phone numbers to our families. Social workers, school psychologists, anyone that families have a relationship with, if they are looking for some advice or just that sounding board, I hope they would have the confidence to reach out. And I have full confidence that our staff will be responsive to help that family. You may decide if you have more than one child to do different things for different children. That's okay. But I, I hope everyone saw, and I'd like to draw attention back to that slide that was shown earlier. We're going to work with families to make sure that we don't create additional stress of having one child on Monday, Tuesday, another child on Thursday, Friday. We want to align the educational assignment of our students for the ease of family for the scheduling that they need to do during this interim of hybrid operation. So, so the, for what, what I heard you say is to go back to the, if you have a child already in school, go back to the counselor there. And if, if you're not satisfied there, then go to the district office. Is that, that what you're saying? You're welcome to ask us questions. Of course, we don't have relationships with students. Right. We can answer questions about programs, but because we don't know the children well, I don't know that they're going to get the best insight from us. It's those that have relationships that know children best that likely will get the better advice. Okay. We can answer programmatic questions, but I think as far as what's a better fit would be better served by those that know the children best. Okay, thank you. Ms. Hammond. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm, I looked, I raised I, I looked at Ms. Okay. Hutchison and said Ms. Hammond. My apologies. Ms. Hutchison, get myself That's in all trouble. Right. Starts with an H. That, that is fine. Um, just to, to follow up, I, I kind of had the same question that um, Mr. Lovelace had. But for, I know we have a lot of people who are listening right now, and they may not know the name of a counselor. Could they just call the school principal of where they're assigned? Yes, ma'am. Okay. The school principal, the front office, um, phones are being answered. Feel free to email, free, free, feel free to call. We want to make sure that we're those partners with our families. And then my other question is, um, I know we've got a lot of at-risk children, and our school counselors and social workers know, in most cases, who these children are. How are we going to keep up with them? I know we've talked a little bit about this, but I certainly am concerned about um, not seeing them five days a week. You know, I keep hearing this concern. So how can we help those children? Superintendent Spearman, our state superintendent of education, has been very clear. Um, she used the phrase, lay eyes on them. So we want to make sure if a family chooses virtual as their model of five, that we still see those students that are engaged with them to make sure that from a wellness um, environment that we know what's going on with children and with families. From School District 5, I commend our school leaderships, um, our admin teams and the support of their counselors. 
We, of course, have up updated the Department of Education for the data that we've needed to collect and have shown that we have a very strong connection rate with our families. I commend our student nutrition program because of the numbers of families that we have served throughout our closure. That gave us a great bridge to see families and to engage with them. I commend Dr. Harris and his team. If you came through our service of nutrition, you saw our social workers, you saw our staff visibly there to make sure that families were reminded of faces and names to be connected. I commend Mr. Wiseman and his team to make sure that things were delivered, uh, whether it was taking packets of information for activities or whether it was taking snack packs that are given by one of our faith-based partners and uh, community partners. We will continue those things. As we've looked back at our performance and our engagement, Dr. Harrison, the executive staff, and I have continued to talk what might we need to do to make sure that engagement continues. If you think back to the presentation tonight, we are clear and expectant to see activity. If we see three consecutive days of absence or inactivity, we are going to take action to find out what is happening with that family, what has happened with that child. Um, there will not be the opportunity for grace over grades during this new beginning of academic year 2021. There will be engagement, there will be rigor, there will be expectations of involvement of our students, our families, and the performance of our entire school district five community. So I hope that we, as we reset for 2021, the strong beginning that we typically have in academic years of the excitement of orientations, of on-site schedule pickups, we're going to build on that momentum to make sure that we've got relationships with new families and for families, as I said to Mr. Lovelace, that are transitioning from one school to another. We've got to build those relationships in a strong, efficient way to make sure that our children are well cared for and that their academic success is a positive year ahead. I want to go, uh, Ms. Hammond, and then Mr. White. Thank you. Um, I, I want to go back over, I, I, this is clarification rather than a question, but Mr. White mentioned the same thing. Um, the October 8th is the target date, provided we make the 7th, 17th, I mean September 8th, our start date. That would be the date, Dr. Melton, that we would look at the hybrid turning into the five-day. Yes, ma'am. Because, you know, I just really want to go on the record of the importance in my mind, and I know this is very simple because it's such a complicated thing. I think as a teacher and a student, either virtual or the five-day were in my mind. And, and we talked about that, Dr. Milton, when that was your first plan. And I really thought that way it took care of people that had, health, had a health concern. They certainly could do it virtual. And if they didn't, it was a parent decision. And I felt it was simpler. Um, so I came here with the thought, I, I didn't know, like you said, we didn't know which presentation would be. But I am certainly willing, in, to me it's a compromise in my mind, and I would like to say that to my constituents that really want a five-day, because it is the best, and we know that. I mean, that's why we have a five-day school day. Um, but I, I understand this pandemic is, is unprecedented times, so I think we all need to help give a little and, and to get, and I just certainly pray that um, by the 8th, and that was, to, I just wanted to reiterate my stand for the importance of the five day, because I'm telling you, as a teacher that did the March 13th to the end, um, May, you do lose students, you do have parents that are just about pulling their hair out to try to get their child to do the work, even good students. And so it, it's, it's a real uphill climb for teachers. It's an uphill climb for parents. And I heard from so many about child care. But again, I just see, Dr. Milton, I'm going to trust you on this. We'll call it a trial. And I'm certainly going to pray that by the 8th, we can get children back in school for their well-being. Because I can tell you another thing to Mr. Hutchinson's point and Mr. Lovelace's. There are children that don't have the same amount of parent control or parent supervision, and those are the children that need school the most, and we will lose them very easily, a small percentage. And I appreciate all the things I heard you say we're going to do to find them, but we lost kids. I talked to parents. I'd get the parent, and he'd say, don't worry, I'm going to get little Johnny to do that, but you didn't get it. We had teachers that went to their homes and principals. So it, it, it's a really hard time, and I just want to say to the public, um, we'll work hard to make this work with my anticipation that we will get back to five days. 
for those that want it and those that have the fear I understand the virtual and the need for it and I support it Mr. White um, sort of on that same theme about kids getting lost in, in the internet question is, is there any way to identify who doesn't have access to so we can try to match up resources because to me that's where I mean particularly with kids that don't come from families of means mm -hmm. and may not know where and how to access help that, that, I mean that's clearly a child that could get lost if they can't get on the hybrid days to, to do their, their work or, or do it properly. I mean, is there, kind of like we contact trace sources of COVID, can we trace kids who don't have internet and try to help them remedy that situation? Uh, I'll look to a variety of people to respond to that. I'll ask Ms. Garris, our director of technology, to come to the microphone first. And as she transitions, this is an issue from a variety of lens. So obviously technology is involved. Our planning and administration with Dr. Harrison, our social workers, they're involved. And then, of course, instruction is involved to check engagement and accountability. Uh, Director Garris, what would you like to add as the first response of this complicated um, question? It is. Um, I think the one thing that I would have added to what Ms. Richardson said, and he did a very good job explaining that, but I would add that um, we do have a survey, the survey that we go out to parents. One of the questions, because it's not anonymous, this is really for planning purposes, it asks about internet access. So between, hopefully we will have some uh, assistance from the state through Act 142, which is one of the um, things that were passed, I think, that Mr. Lovelace you were referring to. If we are able to get hotspots through them, they've given us criteria to help identify those parents that either can't afford internet or they live in an area where there's not internet availability. And then through our survey, we'll know exactly which parents that respond to the survey. And then we rely a lot on our schools. Our, again, going back to the teachers that have relationships, the principals in the building, our social workers that know the student situations, we rely on them also to give us that information. So we've got a lot of different areas that can help us identify those students because sometimes parents don't tell us. And so we rely on that school staff to help identify those students so that we can find all the assistance for them as, as possible. So obviously with the survey it takes engagement and completion. Mm -hmm. Dr. Harris and his team would be monitoring if, if we have students that are appearing on campus that may not have participated in the survey, how we are looking for them to alert us of their needs. Dr. Harris, from your angle, social workers and involvement to make sure that families are receiving the support and the resources that they need for their children to be successful. Explain that picture if you would. Absolutely, and thank you for, for this conversation. Uh, our coordinator of social work and parenting services listening. Uh, by way of uh, live stream, and uh, so she has texted me to kind of, yay, we're having a conversation about students who, uh, Ms. Hammond, as you've indicated, are lost or are at risk. I'll simply add to the conversation this, is that not because of COVID-19, but as a standard, uh, school social workers and parent educators who have worked with students and families on the, pr the prior year and in prior years, uh, one of the things that they do upon their return to school, in fact, they're already engaging in conversation, uh, is that they will pick up where they left off. Uh, uh, those students who have had difficulty along the, uh, along the way, those students who have been without uh, in terms of uh, uh, technology access, we're gonna pick up where we left off last year uh, again, building relationships, maintaining those relationships, and maintaining the open lines of communication to make certain that those students and families are getting what they need uh, as we move forward uh, for the 2021 school year. So that's the one piece that I'd like to add that we have not said that our school social workers and parent educators are going to contribute uh, to this entire uh, conversation. Yeah, Mr. White, one more. I got one more on the safety. Um, I'm looking at the, the priority number five in the reentry plan about health screenings, and it says communications will be utilized to reinforce the importance of staying home when sick. Staff will be required to complete a daily health screening process before reporting to work. Families will be required to complete a daily health screening process for their students. So is this just kind of, we're going to tell you what to do and we're going to ask you to do it, but there's really no way i mean are we doing any sort of screening when kids appear with temperatures or anything like that or is it all just an expectation that people are going to do it just because you're asking them to do it well i i hope if you apply the honor system people honor that um, so i believe cool. that our folks are trustworthy but i also know that there are real health issues that a student may not be well 
and may not know how to express they aren't well. Uh, we've actually tried during academic recovery camp, camp a process of being asked questions of students to see how they are and then we found out it led to some, um, and mind you these are elementary stories, my finger hurts, I bumped my knee. So we're not looking for that kind of distraction but that's in a developmental angle of things. Uh, Dr. Harrison, Dr. Jakes, of course, with their different lens of confidentiality of personnel, but also with responsibility of environment. If we were to talk about how we've operated our nutrition sites during the summer, how we've had our transportation staff involved during the summer, and the staff that we've had on site, in addition to students on site, Dr. Harris, if you would come to the microphone and talk some about the protocols that we've used thus far and how that has helped position us for success. And then, Dr. Jakes, if you would follow from the angle of personnel, how we would then look towards the operations of that to make sure that we had a safe environment of our staff, whether it's their exposure, whether it's them not well, whether it's in the classroom, if you'll answer that piece. So Dr. Harris, if you'll get us started. Absolutely. Let me piggyback on something, Dr. Melton, that you just alluded to in terms of the uh, self-reporting during the uh, academic recovery camp. Uh, we actually did this as well in our summer school program, particularly in the high school. Uh, and I will say to you, uh, Ms. White, that it worked very, very well. Uh, students self-reported when they were not feeling well. Uh, they self-reported when there was a family member who uh, had either contracted uh, COVID-19 or had symptoms of COVID-19. At the high school level, uh, it worked very, very well. Again, maybe not so much at the elementary level uh, in the same way, of course, but we kind of anticipated that uh, just to the uh, developmental aspect of it. But it worked very, very well. We're certainly looking forward to doing something very, very similar to that as we begin the school year. Uh, I think the same thing, and I'm sure Dr. Jake would, would, would uh, advise as well, that, that we are counting on in terms of kind of an honor system of our staff also doing the very same thing. Uh, but one thing that we've said uh, from the beginning and we'll continue to say and articulate that if you're not feeling well, if you are in fact sick, if you are in fact uh, experiencing symptoms, that we're gonna encourage and we are encouraging students and staff to remain at home. Uh, so that we are not uh, inadvertently, uh, unintentionally uh, spreading or uh, any of the, the symptoms of, of the virus. So if I could, just I'm looking at the DHEC guidelines now that are on the website, and it says students should be excluded, students and staff should be excluded if they have a fever or shortness of breath, loss of taste or smell, New or worsening cough for any two of the following, sore throat, muscle ache, body ache, chills, fatigue, headache, et cetera. So are these gonna be the, the screening proto type protocols? You're gonna be asking families to, to every day sort of go through these questions with their students? Those, those are exactly the, the um, uh, prescribed method that we're, we're gonna be using. Uh, one of the top category, I don't have them right in front of me, and two or more of the others. Uh, our nurses, again, are heavily involved with that. Uh, so again, it is about uh, uh, counting on self-reporting, but obviously if students are, or if staff are witnessing that, we want them to communicate with us. So it's an open line of communication on all parts to make certain that we are being as safe as we possibly can in our schools. So, but we're not doing anything like you go to the dentist office and they take your temperature before they let you back. Y'all you, not doing like digital thermometers or anything in elementary school to sort of... Not for every, per not for every person, no, staff and students coming into the building, no, sir. But if somebody, if you think somebody has symptoms with a nurse then... Then the nurse will, has the capability and the responsibility to do, the, to do that, yes, and make contact with families accordingly. Okay. And Dr. Jakes, anything you'd like to add from a personnel lens that would be confidentiality related? I would. I'd like to echo the term Dr. Harris used. He said they have um, the capability and the responsibility. So when it comes to employment and our adults, it's not just suggested, it's expected that they follow those expectations. And what we found similar to the summer sites is with our employees who've already reported they are self-reporting. They are notifying our Office of Benefits when they are undergoing testing. They are notifying um, principals, following up with benefits when they're experiencing symptoms or have had an exposure or an exposure in the household. So we've had quite a bit of practice already. And again, I would, would um, describe this as an expectation. Thank you, Ms. Gardner. I actually have a couple of questions, but one of them is a follow-up to that question. Um, I was listening to Superintendent Spearman, she's our state superintendent, talk to, 
I guess she was reporting or testifying today or yesterday, and she talked about how the nurses would hopefully have the capability and the access to actually test the students if she thought that they were, or the, the staff. That was her hope. Is that something that they've talked to you about? Is that a, th is that a hope, or is that just something that she was saying? Uh, I've not heard that, but I can say that I've not been involved with monitoring local media in the last couple of days. Um, Superintendent Spearman met with superintendents of school districts last Thursday. And at that time, we were not at that place. But of course, as ours is ever changing of information, hers is ever changing as well. So uh, she and her team are to be commended for their constant updates to us as district administrators. If we find that out, we'll of course be prepared for that. But at this point, as far as I know, Dr. Harris has not been given that information. I know that I have not. I see him shaking his head no. So no, ma'am, that may have been announced, but that is not something we have information that we could use for our planning at this point. Okay. That might have just been a hope that she had for the nurses. It might not have been a, a thing, but I assume that that would require special funds to do that, too. I don't know. Most of our nurses are probably capable and licensed to do that anyway. I didn't know if you had heard anything. So. <clears throat> we are fortunate to have the number of nurses that we have in this school district. Of course, we would love to add more, but not all districts are staffed the way we're staffed in School District 5. Um, my concern of that would be without having that information is if we have nurses involved with testing, how might they be involved with identification and the other health needs? Because remember, students will continue to need medications that they have for their own health needs. So the more we place on nurses of additional responsibilities, the more strain and stress we're going to put them under or the more ineffectiveness or the more people we're going to have to pull in to be a support of that health-related <laughs> effort um, during our operations. Okay, and I, I had another question. It's all right, Chairman Cates. Um, this is kind of changing the subject a little bit, not too much because we're still talking about the same thing, but I was just thinking about the timing of our live instruction that we talked about on Wednesdays for our, is it for 6 through 12? Did I get that right? Um, is that going to be, since it's live instruction, it will be a specific time. Our children will be expected to log in at specific times of the day. They can't watch it later or interact later, like the... The distance learning days are more flexible, right? And then I guess I want just a clarification sure. so I'll know what to expect. And just as a side note to that, if we're doing A and B days, would the Wednesdays be every other Wednesday, every other distance learning and live instruction day, would that be also an A or a B day instead of all of the, I know that we're going to have lots of those questions. Maybe we'll just put them online, the answers, but... Uh, those are things that I was thinking about. <laughs> Ask by a secondary parent of School District 5. You have had experience with A day and B day, Ms. Oh, Gardner. Yes. Yes, I'll look to Mr. Giuliano to see if either he or Director Holden would like to answer that. Uh, Mr. G, if you're prepared to answer the question about Wednesdays and how they, would, uh, how they plan to operate. Yes, so for on Wednesdays, there's going to be a modified schedule where the students would come in to their particular class at a particular time. Okay. And what they're going to try to do is actually modify the schedule so they can see all their teachers on that day. So that Wednesday, they'll see every teacher that particular day, but modified so it will not be a full block of time. Okay. So they'll receive a modified schedule on that Wednesday. And of course, um, they'll get a chance for that face-to-face -face live instruction at that time based upon their schedule. Thank you. Other question? Uh, Ms. Hutchison. Um, I, I just wanted to um, uh, tell Dr. Melton how pleased I am to see that masks will be required of, of all our, our staff and our students. Um, I, I think that's just so key. I've heard from um, teachers and from parents who were concerned that they may not be required. So I'm really glad to hear that. Um, of course, we all know that we've heard the news that major retailers have, have gone that direction. And if we want to get to the five-day um, instruction, which, as Ms. Hammond said, we all want to get there, I think this is the safest way. Um, there's nothing perfect, but we can try. As, as we may. So I just want to commend you for that. And then also, um, I know you've got the email address for, um, for people to send questions. And I just wanted to reiterate that because, um, you know, that's a great place for people to submit their questions. You've got the um, web page that has the FAQs, Frequently Asked Questions and Answers. Um, and so that helps all the 
all of our constituents when they send their emails to that particular um, that particular email. So I just wanted to reiterate it. I don't know it right off the top of my head. Thank you for the opportunity, Ms. Hutchison. Uh, Reentry at Lexrich 5, the number 5.org is the address. And we had that in the presentation this evening. And if I could pause to celebrate Ms. Goggins and her team, the volume of questions that we've gotten, we are turning those around as quickly as possible. Uh, most of the emails, I would say, do not have one question but multiple parts. So um, we are trying to make sure that we give a response to each um, email that we receive, but some because of the complicated questions are being asked or because of the number of questions being asked. We want to make sure that when we offer responses, we can offer assurance of accuracy. But I encourage people to use the reentry at lexrich5.org for emails to make sure that you have an opportunity to be engaged with us. The FAQ is becoming so comprehensive, and uh, thanks to our families for submitting questions, and quite frankly, our staff as well. We continue to build that, and I encourage people to keep a watch of that document to make sure they're informed and also up to date. Mr. Gant. Thank you, Mr. Case. Just a quick, quick comment. I, I wanted to, again, commend Dr. Melton and her staff, and, and I think it tells us we do have a a dynamic situation with this pandemic and, and these plans are ever changing. Um, I, I did want to ask, and I don't know if this is, it might've been covered and I missed it. My audio, my, the coverage has been very good. Since we're looking for, I hope the numbers for the pandemic for positive cases to go down. And we've got a little over seven weeks or so before potential start date that we're considering tonight with a different calendar. And then a month after that, a date that we might go to a five day um, in person teaching, which is, I hope and pray that we can get there. And I would like to ask the administration to look into working with DHEC and possibly the CDC, but to, to figure out the proper benchmark what is the safe benchmark for positive cases and hospitalizations in our state or the positive things they think have to happen for a school to safely open to protect our students and our staff? And I know you all are already working with DHEC, but that might be, that, that number of that um, percentage has got to be there. And I think our community is gonna look hard to us to, to give positive reasoning why we're ready to enter school number one other than virtual and number two hopefully later doing a five day per week in person but i'd like to ask the administration dr melton to look into a proper benchmark to maybe amend our reports to say this is what we've got to get to to feel safe thank, thank you thank you mr gant i know they're working with the accelerate ed recommendations and dhec and we know that you'll continue to do that. Yes, one last question. Thank you. Uh, I'd like Dr. Melton to explain to me, I think I'm remembering it right, as far as the virtual choice, the high school has to stay in it for the semester. Am I saying that right? And the elementary, it was for a, like a nine week period. Would, would you explain to me why it is longer for them? for the high school? Yes, ma'am, uh, and I'll look to either Dr. Harris or Mr. Giuliani, one of them may like to weigh in on this. When we were looking at early elementary education versus secondary, and because of staffing needs at secondary, we know that we need to establish schedules for our secondary faculty and staff to make sure that we can offer the appropriate courses and content. I also wanna make sure that when we look at an elementary age student, elementary is learning how to read, we need to make sure that we offer that on site. So we felt like for elementary, for the curriculum they offer, for the developmental development, for the development, for the development of our students, that we're responsible to their needs of learning, that they be brought back on site sooner because we know that virtual is not developmentally best for all children at that age bracket of early childhood and elementary education. Of course, our secondary students have um, more practice and maturity, mm -hmm. so they can shift a little differently. If there are families that have situations that may be hardships, Dr. Harris already has a process and policies in place. 
we would work with that. So if there's a family that's chosen one option, but they need to shift into another, Good. That although we've got this as our template for guiding, we don't forget that education is unique Good. and we're going to individualize. So if there are families that make one selection and need to slide into the other, we will have our consistent hardship processes in place that have been a part of our operations for years. Uh, Mr. G or Dr. Harris, from a physical thumbs up, you'd like to add to it or come to the microphone if you'd like to add. Um, if you, if, all right, Mr. G. Thank you that you're fluid on that. I was thinking somebody that decided the sem have to do the semester in some hardship, I mean, you know, to do with computers and at home, mm -hmm. they have that choice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just one additional um, to add on to that is the high school, the complexity of the scheduling and to make sure we have the staffing you know, in School District 5, we try to offer our students a wide array of courses. But to be able to do that, we need to make sure that we have staffing available by that semester. Ideally, we'd really like families to stay in 5 the entire year. That would help us with scheduling even more. But knowing that we want to provide families choice is why we came up with the semester. We backed it off a little bit because of the complexity of those schedules and the courses that we offer. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. I believe we've all had a chance to uh, ask multiple questions. Again, a lot of these questions are in the FAQ. I know communication staff will be uh, probably adding some of these questions that have been asked tonight. Dr. Mellon, I just want to thank you for the hard work. And, you know, we're not this isn't just about numbers, it's about children. And there's 17,500 approximately. They're counting on us to get it right, not some of the time, all of the time. And I know that it's been a difficult uh, process. And to our community, we appreciate uh, the grace. The numbers are changing, and uh, we'll have to change uh, with them. To our teachers, our faculty, our staff, you're amazing, and we want you to hear that. Um, I've seen you in action as a parent whose family experienced significant crisis. You came along, my boys, not just to teach them math or reading recovery or, um, you know, whatever was going on that day, but you came alongside them and nurtured them and cared for them. Um, there's a principal that, that's here that said, come, come have lunch in my office because you need a little extra time. The nutrition worker that came alongside them uh, because they knew they were having a bad day. Those are superstars, and those are the quality of people that we have in District 5, and we want to celebrate them uh, every day. So I just wanted to, I just want to be clear on behalf of this board how much we appreciate uh, what our faculty, staff, and administration is doing uh, to help us navigate not just uncharted waters, but we're in a body of water. We don't even know uh, what the body of water is. So thank you very much.